Group theory. You may have heard of this mysterious mathematical term before, but what is group theory? And more importantly, why do we care? Group theory is an exciting field of mathematics that has applications in countless fields of mathematics, computer science, physics, even architecture, design, music. Now, group theory sounds intimidating, but on a fundamental level, group theory is actually quite simple, and in my opinion, one of the most beautiful branches of mathematics that there is. If you've ever used a kaleidoscope, group theory provides the mathematical framework to describe the beautiful symmetries you see when you look inside. Pretty cool, right? Not only that, group theory can be used to describe snowflakes, mirrors, even your favorite wallpaper. But before we talk more about the symmetries of group theory, let's talk about what group theory even is. So what is a group? And what's so theoretical about it? Now a mathematical group, by definition, is just a set along with a law of composition. And that set and law of composition must follow three essential rules of group theory. Now in case you're unfamiliar with this terminology, a law of composition is simply a rule that says if you have two elements in a group, element A and element B, you have to combine them to create a third element, C, which is also in the group. So I mentioned that a group has to follow three fundamental rules of group theory. There are three things that a group needs. A group needs an identity element, inverses, and associativity. Briefly, an identity element is an element that makes it so other elements don't change. Inverses are elements that when combined give you the identity element. And associativity basically just means that it doesn't matter where you put parentheses in a mathematical operation. Let's break this down with an example. There's one fundamental and extremely simple group that you're probably already familiar with, the integers. 0, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. These form a group. Let's break that down. In order to show that the integers are a group, we have to be able to show that the integers meet the definition of a group. First off, we need a law of composition to combine two integers to get a third integer. Here, we can use addition. Addition works because we can combine any two integers by adding them and get a third integer. 1 plus 2 is 3, 1 plus negative 1 is 0, negative 500 plus 502 is 2, and all of these elements are still within the set of integers. Next, we have to make sure that integers meet all three laws of groups, identity, inverses, and associativity. So for the identity element, we need to think of an element of the integers that when we combine it to another element, the element remains unchanged. In other words, we need an element that when you add it to another element, you still get that other element. Can you think of what that might be? Zero. Next, we need inverses. Like I said before, inverses are two elements that when combined, give you the identity. Can you think of what that might be for integers? Any positive number combined with its negative counterpart gives you zero. Thus, every element in the integers has its inverse element, which is its negative counterpart that gives you zero. Finally, the integers adhere to associativity because we can combine any three integers and it doesn't matter where we put the parentheses. One plus two plus three is equal to one plus two plus three. So the integers are a group, but there are actually countless other groups out there. Some of them are as simple as just one element large. Let's say, for instance, that we just had an identity element, zero, and that was the only thing in our set. Well, zero plus zero equals zero, so if we add zero together, we stay inside of the set. Zero is the identity, zero plus zero is zero, so zero is its own inverse. And zero would adhere to associativity because it doesn't matter where we put the parentheses when we're adding a ton of zeros together. But now let's look at some cooler applications of group theory. So I mentioned at the start of the video that group theory can be used to describe symmetries. So let's look at how group theory works with mirrors. One place you can see group theory in your everyday life is when you're looking in a bathroom mirror. Mirrors provide reflectional symmetry. So you can think of each reflection across a mirror as an element of a group. 
For instance, standing here right now, I'm not reflected over any mirrors, which means I'm like the identity element. I'm unchanged and I'm just standing here. But when I look at my reflection in a bathroom mirror, there's another version of me over there. This version of me is the result of one reflection across a mirror. And you'll notice that if you start with that version of me and reflect back, you get back to me, the identity element. So this would be a two element group. The version of me on this side of the mirror and the version of me on that side of the mirror. But if you have more than one mirror, you can take this even further. For instance, in this bathroom, I have two mirrors that are perpendicular to each other. This results in a group with four elements. I have the version of me on this mirror, the version of me on this mirror, and the version of me that's a result of reflecting across both mirrors. Finally, I also have me, the identity element. Let's break down the mirror example mathematically. We can draw the mirrors as two lines. Now where I was standing taking the video, we can call right here. And if we don't do anything to this point here, it's like the identity element. Now if we reflect over this line, we get element A. Reflecting over this line, we can call element B. And if we reflect over both lines, first over A, then over B, we get element AB. Thus, we can think of reflecting across this mirror as element A of our group. Reflecting across this mirror results in element B of our group. And then reflecting across both mirrors results in element AB of our group. We can define the rules that A squared equals the identity, because reflecting across this mirror and reflecting back gives you me, the identity. Similarly, we can say that B squared equals the identity, because reflecting across this mirror and back also results in me, the identity. Now to get from element AB back to me, the identity, we have to first reflect from element AB across mirror B to mirror A, and then reflect from element A back to me, the identity. Pretty cool, right? Now I know what you're thinking. Four versions of Eva is not enough versions of Eva. Don't worry, because we can take this one step further. Let's look at infinity mirrors. Each version of me that you see in these mirrors is the result of a certain series of reflections across three mirrors. Mirror A, Mirror B, and Mirror C. Unlike the example with only four elements, this is an infinite group because we can compile a series of reflections that takes you further and further and further away from the identity, resulting in infinite versions of me. But don't fret. Remember our second axiom of group theory. There always has to be an inverse for any element of the group. So no matter how far away you are from the original me, the identity, you can always get back here through a reverse series of reflections across our three mirrors. Group theory truly is everywhere. You can see it in snowflakes, shapes, even in groups of people. All you need is a law of composition and you need to follow all three rules of group theory. As I mentioned before, group theory has a variety of applications. You can take these fundamental rules and create complex applications in cryptography, quantum mechanics, design, even games. If you've ever played with a Rubik's Cube, these things are built on group theory. So the next time you look in a bathroom mirror, not only can you appreciate how good you look, you can also appreciate the beauty that is group theory.